So welcome to this tutorial, which is going to update the tutorial I did on compositing uh, in order to look in more depth at how passes work in Houdini 12. And there have been a number of changes in Houdini 11 and Houdini 12, which make the kind of setup uh, that we were using for that series of videos much easier. And I want to demonstrate a few of the features today. So I've got exactly the same scene set up here that I had for that earlier series of videos, which is this deck chair, and I'm going to composite it over a, a background. Uh, and I can show you that background here, I expect. If we have a look at it, there we are. So it's this beach background that we're going to use for the composite. Uh, I'm not going to duplicate every step that I did in the earlier video, so it will help if you've if you've watched that, but you may be able to follow this even if you haven't. So in Houdini uh, 12, you can do a number of things which were not possible in Houdini 10 when I did that video. And a number of features that were in existence in Houdini 10 have changed uh, pretty fundamentally. So let me first of all look at some of the features for defining passes that come for free, uh, if you like, with Houdini. And this is now different from Houdini 10. And one of the things that you have to do if you're using an old scene is to update your shaders to make sure you're using the new type of shader. So what I've done here is that these are almost all material shader, shader builder shaders which I've created and they mimic the uh, the shading that we had on the earlier model. Uh, but because they're the updated shaders, it means that the output variables that I'm going to demonstrate in a second work out of the box. If you use some of the older shaders, then these passes won't necessarily work. So let's lay down a mantra node. In fact, I've got one here. And at the moment, it's set up just to render everything uh, without any changes. So let's have a look and see what that's looking like. In fact, let me use the render view. And we can see that we get a pretty dark version of our deck chair here. And that's because I haven't got any environment lighting. So let me add some environment lighting. And this became much easier in Houdini 12 and Houdini 11. And I can do it using the shelf here. And I can just control click on the environment light. And what I want to do is use the background, that image I showed you earlier, as the background for my environment light. So I've just put that in here. And I'm going to turn the lighting way down to say 0.2. Otherwise, it'll be too strong. And let's re-render this. And we can see that's now a little bit brighter. We're getting a bit more light on the back of our deck chair. Let's have a look now at what happens uh, when we try and create some passes. So let's go back to our mantra node and let's add some passes. And if you remember, passes can be added on the properties tab and the output sub tab. So let me add an extra image plane. And this will allow me to add an arbitrary variable that's being output from my shaders. Now the default shaders, the mantra surface builder, come with a very large list of output variables. So you can have your color and opacity. Obviously, we're not going to use those because we get them anyway. So let's have a look at this direct diffuse. And then, in fact, I'm going to just pause this render. And then I'm going to add another one. And I'm going to add direct reflect. Then another one, and we're going to have direct refract. I'm going to leave because there's no refraction in my scene. Uh, 
no volume, there's no emission either, direct unshadowed, I will just show you, I'm not going to actually use it, and then that may be the last one that I need, let me just check, I'm not going to show you reflectivity, shadow mat is special and we're going to come to that in more detail in a moment, so let's let's leave it at that. And let me render this out and see what we get. And in fact, uh, I've rendered this rather large, but I think you can see the, the render there on the video. And we come with a number of output planes here. So if we have a look at the no shadow, uh, that's just ignoring any shadows cast by the light. Reflect is just giving us the reflections of objects and lights. In other words, that's our specular path. But it also includes reflections of objects, if you've got a reflective material, as we have here. And then the diffuse is, is the standard diffuse. The thing that's missing from Houdini 11 and 12 is what used to be called the paint path, or the paint arbitrary output variable, uh, which just gave you the color of the object with no lighting. That's no longer easily available in Houdini 12, so we need to adopt a slightly different approach to the composite later on. So these are the standard variables that come for free. And you'll have noticed that when I look down this list here of available options, we have all of these direct then indirect, this is where we, if we're using, for example, photon mapping or indirect uh, final gather type effects using multiple diffuse bounces, then this will show up here in these indirect arbitrary output variables. Uh, and then you could have both combined, like so. So let me call this mantra main. And I'm going to save it out to this main picture here, main dot pick here. So that's going to be our sort of first tranche of passes. Let's try now and have a look at some of the more complicated passes. So first of all, let's try and do an, a an ambient occlusion pass. Now, if you remember in Houdini 10, this required using a special shader, and it required us to use takes, and it was really quite complicated. Uh, and this is much easier in Houdini 12, so let me call this mantra AO. And I'm going to include in this uh, all of the standard objects. I'm also going to include that floor proxy object, which uh, allows us to cast shadows on the floor. And I'm going to include an extra light in our scene. And that can be done by laying down, in fact, uh, let's just control click here, we get an extra environment light. And we can go down to the bottom here and where it has rendering mode, we can change this to ambient occlusion. And I'm going to just turn off this light because I don't want it to render normally. I just want it to render when this pass is enabled. And I could set up a take here and, and switch this light back on. Uh, but what I can do instead of that is on my lighting tab here, use a solo light and use that light there. And let me just name that and the other one. So this is env light direct and this is env light AO. So now if I've got this right, this will be rendering some ambient occlusion. So let's have a look and see what it looks like. 
and indeed we are getting ambient occlusion. There are a couple of problems with this, however, one of which we can correct in the render, and the other of which we'll need to wait for the composite to correct. The first problem is that we're getting, in, and if you remember from the earlier set of videos, what you actually need is not ambient occlusion where the dark areas are in shadow, but you need a kind of reverse of that so that you have these areas light and the areas with no occlusion dark uh, in order that you can get around the fact that you, that you just have this odd shaped proxy bit of geometry here. I'm not going to cover that now, we'll come to that in the composite. But the other problem is that we've got colours on our objects, they're, they're being shaded with the shaders, where actually what we want is for this to be a simple matte sort of colour. So let me uh, address that. And the first thing I can do is to add some extra properties to my Mantra renderer node. And the extra property that I want, I happen to know, is called Disable. And if I disable the surface shader, so I'm going to add that property here. Now, the Mantra node works uh, by basically sending a number of properties to the renderer. And by default, the most useful properties are already in the interface here. But some of them are, if you like, hidden because they're not used that often. And to discover those, you need to do what I just did then, which is to edit the parameter interface, go to the For Rendering tab, and then find uh, the property that you want. Click this button here and add it. Uh, and what this will allow you to do, and in fact you can see it's added this shader tab here, is I can disable surface shader rendering. And as it happens, this just leaves a kind of blank surface material which is perfect for the rendering of ambient occlusion. So this is ignoring all the shaders that are assigned to our objects and just using that ambient occlusion effect. So let's try rendering that and see what we get. Uh, and we can see that we're getting uh, a better effect. These have no longer got the, the colors on them, but these wheels have. And the reason for that is, if you remember, that unlike for the other objects, these other objects have materials assigned here at the object level. I used this material SOP to apply different materials to the different parts of the wheel using two groups, wheel inner and wheel outer. And in fact, I did that deliberately in order to demonstrate some of the problems that arise when you use a material SOP. It's almost always better to split your object into two objects using an object merge and using your groups and assigning the materials here at the sea level. Now, I haven't done that, and I want to show you how you can get around this problem. Uh, and there's a very useful new uh, property in Houdini 12 that we can stick on our renderer. So on my Mantra Ambient Occlusion node, I'm going to edit the parameter interface again, go to the for rendering, let's get rid of my filter, and what I want is Mantra Geometry and somewhere here, if I can find it, is something which disables, here we are, ignore geometry attribute shaders. So if I add that to my interface and I can apply that and then accept it. What we should see is that under the Properties tab here, if we go along, we have the Geometry sub-tab. And these two parameters here all the time. The new one is this Ignore 
geometry attribute shaders. And what this does is tell the renderer to ignore any shaders that have been assigned using that material SOP. So let me render that out and see what we get. And we can now see that we're getting a scene with no shaders applied. I'm just going to change the I can find it. I'm going to change it so that it's uh, slightly better. Here we are. That it has a slightly better. So I'm going to have an angle of 90. I'm going to have a max ray distance of, say, 7. And I'm going to have a sampling quality of 50. And what that should mean is that we have a much smoother output when I render. And there we are. So that's pretty good. Let me assign that to a file. So I'm going to assign that here to AO.pic. So that's going to render out an ambient occlusion pass. I want to come back now to that use of the environment light to light the scene and indeed to give something for the reflective material that's on the frame of the deck chair uh, to reflect. And I want to demonstrate that in a little bit more detail by using this sphere that's in the scene. As if you remember, I put a sphere in the scene to test the lighting. So let me go down and lay down another mantra node. And I am going to take out this candidate objects. So now no objects are going to be selected by the render. But if I then select an object in the force objects, and that's going to be the only thing that's rendered. And that object, I happen to know, has a simple chrome shader applied to it, uh, which is a reflective shader. So that's going to show us uh, exactly what the reflections are going to look like. And the reflective intensity is set at 1. So let's see what this produces. So we see we are getting a reflection of the of the scene of that environment map. And in fact what I'm going to do is just see this in our interactive renderer. So let me render that out. And we can see it there. And in the old video in Houdini uh, 10, I used a rather complicated system of using the transforms from a null to orient my environment map. Uh, I don't need to do that this time round, because if we have a look at our environment, light, which is down over here, uh, it has a transforms tab. So I can rotate it around the y-axis, like so, and as I do so, we can see that the reflections change. Now, at the moment, uh, this is these, these reflections are quite dull. And the reason for that is that my light intensity is very low. And the reflections are proportional to the light intensity. So if I turn up the light intensity, the reflections increase. I may not want, however, uh, a direct connection between the lighting of my scene, the intensity of the light that's affecting everything, including the diffuse uh, reflections, I may not want to connect that directly to the intensity of the reflection of the environment. I may want to use a very low environment light, but have quite clear, bright reflections on the reflective materials. So I can divorce these two things, and I can do that. 
by laying down another environment light. In fact, I'm just going to copy and paste the one that I've already got. And let's call this Reflect. And what I can do with this light is change it from direct lighting to ray tracing background. Now that's going to mean that the ray tracing engine, which is calculating the reflections from our reflective materials, is instead of going to look at, it's not no longer going to look at this environment light to see what the environment looks like. Uh, it's going to look at this environment light here, the one that's set to ray tracing background. And that means that I can increase the intensity of this to one, so we get really bright reflections, while maintaining the same lighting for our scene as a whole. So that's a, a more detailed explanation of my reflection reflective component. Uh, let's move on now uh, and have a look at shadow mats. So now let's have a look at generating a shadow mat. And this is a completely different system from Houdini 10. In Houdini 10 you had to assign a particular shader to the objects which you wanted to be uh, had to have a shadow mat. Uh, things are a bit easier in Houdini 12. So I can lay down a mantra node and let's call this shadow floor and what I want is to see the shadows on the floor cast by the deck chair. So the first thing I need to do is to make sure that my floor is visible and by default uh, it's not visible so I need to force its appearance. So I'm going to put it here under the forced objects parameter. Uh, so that's going to ensure that my floor appears and then on my properties and my output tab I'm going to add an image plane and I'm going to set it to direct shadow mat. Uh, and let's render that out and see what we get. So this is my beauty pass but I want my direct shadow pass and we can see that we're getting what we expect which is to s that is to say so something where the shadows are indicated by brightness and the areas which are not shadowed are dark uh, and we want that because that makes it much easier to mask off the shadow areas when we come to the composite but there is a problem with this which is that for the composite to work I'm going to need to get rid of uh, this deck chair uh, we're just going to want the shadow cast by the deck chair onto the ground. We're not going to want the deck chair itself. And in Houdini 10, that was quite a complicated thing to do. We needed to take each of those individual objects and ensure that they were what are called phantom objects. In Houdini 12, uh, we can do it much more easily because we just need to go up to our Objects tab and we can see that we've got this forced phantom parameter. Now, a phantom object is one which doesn't appear in your main render, but does appear in things like reflections and shadows. And that's exactly what we want here. So if I select the components of my deck chair, which is the frame, the top and the wheels, and I accept that pattern and I render again, what we should see is that we're getting, as we want, uh, sorry, let me show you the shadow mat, we're getting, as we want, just the shadow cast by the deck chair. So I'm happy with that. So let me go to the Properties tab and change the output to Shadows Floor. Now I can use exactly the same workflow to create the shadows for the deck chair itself. Uh, I'm not going to go through that because it really is identical and in fact in the composite I'm going to do today I'm not going to not going to adjust those shadows however what I do need uh, is uh, to have some masks and 
The masks are where you create a plane or a channel which represents the presence or the absence of a particular object. And in this case, because I've only got three objects, I can use a standard color render with the red area representing one object, the green area another, and the blue area the third. And that, that will allow us to mask off the, the areas covered by the different objects. Now I've already got a take set up called masks. That I'll show it to you here. Uh, and we can see that it consists of just reassigning the materials on each of those main objects, these ones here. These objects here. Whoops. Didn't mean to do that. There we go. Let's zoom in again. So these objects, the top, the wheel, and the frame. So if I have a look at the frame, we can see normally it's got this reflective property, this reflective shader. If I go into the masks, it's got the blue shader. In fact, uh, I make sure that's actually pointing to the blue, and that one pointing to, say, the red, and the wheels pointing to green. So that should ensure, let's have a look, when we lay down a mantra node here, and I'm going to call this mantra masks, and I'm going to change the take so that we're using that masks take. So that's going to mean that instead of those standard reflective shaders, uh, and, the, and the shader for the top and so on, we're going to have red, green, and blue. Let's just render that out and see what we get. Uh, and that's not entirely works. Let me just see why that is. So let me just double check that... See what the frame is in masks. Yeah, it's not picked the right. It's still got some old shaders here. That's what uh, that's what the problem is. That should now be all right. So let's render that again. And there we are. That gives us our, our masks. And I better make sure that those are being output to the right place. So let me put this to masks. Now, I probably want to render all of these passes at once if I want to render one of them. Uh, and I can do that by using a merge node like this. And I, I can just connect all of these passes into the merge node like so and that means that when I render the merge node each of those passes is going to be rendered out so when I click this and I click render we can see it tells you what's being rendered here and it's just rendering all that out I'm going to pause the video while that renders Let's look now at how to composite this all together. So let me go to my image network. And I've already laid down the basics of a composite here. Uh, and what I've got is something that's actually do it here. Change to our composite view. So what I've got is our masks. I've got the background plate. I've got that main render, which has the diffuse and reflective passes in it. Uh, I've got my ambient occlusion. I've got my shadows. And then I've done some channel copies here to separate out uh, the channels that I want to use, because in general, when you're manipulating things in the compositor, you need the information to be in the color channel rather than 
in those separate channels. So the channel copy allows me, in this case, to copy into the color channel C the diffuse channel that we've generated, and this one I'm copying in the reflective channel. And here I'm just copying the, those shadows from the floor into the, uh, the color channel. I'm also copying them into the alpha channel because uh, what I'm doing here is copying the shadow red component into the alpha channel. That's because otherwise, uh, if we had a look at this, so I didn't have this here. If I just had the color copy, we would see that our alpha channel has the, the floor in it like this, which is, which is not really what we want. So it's useful to copy, as I did there, the alpha in, so that the alpha is the same as the color channels. So this gives us the basics of what we need to do the composite. Well, let me start by looking at the ambient occlusion, which is probably the most complex part of the composite. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, the easiest uh, way to handle the ambient occlusion is to have an ambient occlusion image where the areas that are shadowed are actually light, and the areas where there's no shadowing are dark. Uh, and this will also help us get rid of this arbitrary sort of floor that we've got here, which obviously doesn't relate to the real world. And the way we can do this is using an invert to start with. So let me do that. And the invert is indeed creating light areas where we want them, but it's also creating this big white space here. Uh, and what I can do to get rid of that is to do operation in unpremultiplied space and also change our alpha so that that's not being affected by uh, the invert. The next thing I can do is use a color correct to subtract quite a bit like that, so that that takes away all of that area that was showing. Then, uh, by the way, this error is just telling us that it's quantizing the image at that point, doesn't matter. Then uh, I need to put a limit down, which makes sure that my range is 0 to 1. And then and equalize, which ensures that the brightest areas have a value of 1 and the darkest areas 0. So that's got the kind of image uh, that we want for ambient occlusion. Let's now have a look at how we will adjust and color correct our diffuse and reflective components. And one of the errors I made, a uh, foolish error in the earlier video, was to do my color correction in pre-multiplied space. And of course, in fact, you should always do your color correction in unpremultiplied space and then go back to pre-multiplied space once you've finished your composite. What's, uh, what do I mean by pre-multiplied? Well, uh, as we know, every image has some color these channels, red, green, and blue, and an alpha. This is our alpha here. And the important thing about the alpha is at the edges here, the alpha is not one. It, one of the reasons you get nice smooth edges is this alpha fades off as you, as you go near the edge. And by default, the color is being pre-multiplied by the alpha. So if we have a look here at the edge of this, we can see that it's not a uniform color, it, it fades to black. And that's because it's pre-multiplied. And what we actually want to do is unpre-multiplied. So it's no longer being multiplied by the alpha and it's just a pure color. So I can use a pre-multiply node to do that. And instead of multiply by alpha, I can divide by alpha. And we can now see that this edge is, is the right one to look at. If we have a look at here, this is the edge of our geometry before I do that. 
there and we can see that it fades to black. When I do the pre-multiply, we can see that it's sharp. And that's important when we come to do color corrections. So I want to do the same again for the reflective component. And I can then use the color correct on each of these. And I could use color curves, any other kind of color correction. I'm just going to put in a color correct node for the moment. And then I want to make sure that these two things are composited together. And in fact, what I need to do is add them because the diffuse and reflective components of our lighting are added together to produce the final result. So let me lay down an add node. Uh, and it doesn't matter which order we put these in, but I can add them together. And that looks pretty good, uh, what you would expect. However, uh, it does have a problem, uh, which is if we have a look at our alpha, and that also looks fine, if I hit I to inspect my alpha, we can see that my alpha has a value of 2. And that's going to cause a problem, because alpha should be in the range 0 to 1. If, if it has a value of 2, we're going to get problems here at the edges. Uh, and the reason it's got a value of 2 is that by default... The plane scope here is set to include the alpha, uh, which means we're just adding the alpha for the two images, which we don't want to do. So we're going to uncheck that, and I'm just going to take the alpha from the first uh, image here, which is fine because essentially the alphas are the same. So the next things I need to, need to do is to put that back into pre-multiplied space and then composite using an over node. Composite that over the background plate. So that becomes the foreground. This is our background. And we add that in like so. And let me just revert that color correct back to the defaults. And there we have it. Let me now look at how to add shadows and the ambient occlusion. So let's have a look at our shadow pass again. If we have a look at that, we can see... So if we have a look at the channel copy, we can see that we're just getting bright where the shadows are and dark where they're not. So this means that we can use a color correct uh, on our image. Now, where should I put that color correct? Well, I'm going to have, I want the shadows to be underneath uh, this deck chair which I'm adding. Therefore, I've got to add them in before this over operation. So I need to add them in up here. And I can add them in using a color correct. And we don't need to worry about the pre multiplied space and so on because we're going to use a mask here. And I'm going to use the output of this channel copy as the mask for our color correction. Now, you'll remember that I made sure that the alpha channel also contained that shadow information. So what I can do here is multiply this down like so to give ourselves some shadows. Now, one of the things I can do again is that trick with luminance. So, find another area that's in shadow, such as there. See what the luminance is. It's about 0.25. So, I probably want my shadows under the deck chair to be about 0.25. So, there's a little bit dark. There you are. That's, that's probably all right. Uh, so that means that when we composite in our deck chair, uh, there are some shadows. And the other thing we could do here is add a blur node into our mask. So I'm putting a blur node below the shadows here. And I can 
blur out our shadows like so and make a slightly more realistic shadow effect. Now there are some things I need to correct here. This this leg is not attached to the ground, so it's, it's causing a it's creating a rather odd shadow. Uh, but broadly speaking, that's that's all right. In fact, I'm going to blur that a little less, uh, and that looks about all right. And we can use the same technique for the ambient occlusion, and of course that applies to the whole scene. So color correct. Bring in our ambient inclusion, which is here, as the mask. Let's try that again. Let's enlarge this so I can see it a little bit better. So we bring in the ambient occlusion from here, and we're putting it in as a mask. There we go. And in the ambient occlusion case, I think probably I should use the red or green component because I'm not sure I set up the alpha correctly. So let's use the red component as our mask. And in this case, what I can do is use the color correct to darken using the ambient occlusion like so, just to give a little bit of a have a slightly darker area around this. Uh, we probably want it to be quite subtle, like so. Well, let's take a look now at how to use those masks we created earlier from the red, green and the blue channels. And this is going to be quite complicated, uh, but let's see a sort of naive way of looking at this. Uh, which would be to say, well, uh, we want to color correct uh, the diffuse, but we only want to do so for a bit of our set of objects. So let's put a color correct down, and then with our masks, let's just connect in the mask as a mask. There we are. We've got it in the mask input there, so the color correct is only going to work on the areas of the object uh, which are covered by the mask. And we can choose uh, the mask channel here, red, green or blue, representing the three objects that we had. So let's, uh, for example, take a look at the blue, which if I remember right, I think the blue is the frame. So let's have a look at that. So if we were to really extremely affect the frame by a large amount, that would make it nice and bright. Uh, and that looks all right on the frame. But we can see that we've got a problem here, uh, which is where the frame meets uh, the canvas cover of the seat. And the reason for that is that we have areas here which are overlapping, which are both seat and frame, and the red value here is less than one uh, because it's not fully on the frame, but neither is it uh, fully off the frame. So you're getting a proportion of this multiplication is being applied to those pixels on the edge, which are lighter because they're overlapping with the canvas material, uh, which is why we're getting this sort of edging effect. So we're going to need to adopt a different approach. So the approach we need to take is to get rid of what's causing this. And what is causing it is the fact that we're using pixel sampling. And pixel sampling is where the renderer shoots off, and this is a simplification, shoots off a number of rays uh, into the scene uh, to have a look at the color at each of the places where those rays hit and average the result to produce the color of the pixel. So if we have a look at our uh, render node here under the sampling tab, you will see that we've got pixel samples of three by three. So what this is doing is sampling nine pixels or nine places in the scene and combining the results into a single pixel. And that's how we're getting an overlap between areas which are on the frame and are on the seat. And that's basically a good thing because it produces nice smooth edges on your scene.
Now, fortunately, there's a way to prevent the renderer doing this. That is to say, there's a way to get it to sample uh, those same number of samples, so nine for every pixel, but instead of combining the results, uh, it enlarges our output size to include all of the samples. And the tick box for doing that is here on the output tab, and it's called subpixel output. So what this is going to do is going to increase the size of our image to account for all those extra samples. Now I could apply this to all of our render nodes, uh, but I'm only going to apply it to the main, which has got, our, if you recall, has got our um, two extra output planes for the diffuse and the reflection. And I'm going to obviously apply it to our masks output, like so. And let me render this out and then I can show you what it looks like. So I'm going to render that out and I'm going to pause the video. So let me go back into my compositor and let's have a look at that main image. Now it looks exactly the same as it did before and the reason for that is that we need to reload the sequence. So I hit reload sequence and if I middle click on this uh, what we should see is something which tells us the size of the image and we can see that it's now 3000 pixels by 2000 pixels whereas the base image uh, is well we can have a look here 1084 by 721 so let me show you this on the screen I'll need to size it down and we can see if we zoom in here we can see uh, that each of these pixels is now either on the frame or on uh, the seat, but they don't overlap. And the same is true if we have a look at our masks. We have a look at the masks. And again, I'm going to need to zoom out. And we can see the same thing at least when I reload, the same thing should be true. And we can see it is. Now we'll have a problem if Mantra has used different sampling for these two renders. In other words, if in our main render here, it's using a different set of pattern of rays being sent out so that in the main render something will be on the seat and here it will be on the frame. Now fortunately that doesn't happen because Mantra is sophisticated enough to use a regular sampling pattern. So what I can do uh, just to demonstrate that that's the case is lay down a mask node and all the mask node does is sort of mask off areas of the image. So let's feed in the input from our masks render and I'll take uh, the blue channel which I know is the frame and then attach the main here and what we should see there we are is the frame and we can see it's very clean uh, the pixels aren't overlapping with the seat there at all they're all actually pixels that are on the frame so this means that we can now use our color correct here to change the frame without any danger of it affecting pixels that belong in fact to the seat. But of course uh, we're going to end up with an image that's much too big 3000 by 2000 pixels as opposed to 1084 by 721. Fortunately there's a node called the scale node, which allows us to adjust the size of our image. So let me just move that across. Uh, and it allows us, if we change this to two second images resolution, uh, it will allow us to nicely downsize our image and smooth out all those edges again.
and we can change the filter. I'm going to use a Gaussian filter. That produces a, a smoother result, as we can see. And then we can continue by compositing over the original image, uh, and then by adding the ambient occlusion. And we can see there's an issue here with the ambient occlusion around this, this leg now. Well, that issue was indeed being caused by some difference in the scaling. So I have corrected it by changing the ambient occlusion render so that it is also producing sub-pixel output. And then here in the compositor, exactly the same sequence of operations, except that I've then rescaled it back to the size of the incoming image here. And then we're using the same color correct to produce the effect. So that looks pretty good. And that just about covers what I wanted to say about passes in Houdini 12. Thank you very much.